Let's say if I, if I were to say to you, hoy, cuando predico, uh, quiero no tener uh, pelos en mi lengua y tiro la casa por la ventana, ayudarte a entender. Uh, a couple of you are thinking, that is the worst Spanish I've ever heard. <laughs> do not do that ever again. You've butchered my language. Uh, a few of you, a bunch of you are maybe going like, what is the guy talking about? Is he speaking in tongues? Is that allowed here? Do we do that here now? I don't know what's going on. So, so obviously to communicate to you what I just said in Spanish, we need to do the work of translation. We need to look at what those, what those words mean and find the equivalent English words. In which case we come out with today, when I preach, I don't want to have any hairs on my tongue and I'm going to throw the house through the window in order to help you to understand. So it's clear, right? Yeah, you all understand exactly what I was saying. No, because of course those are those are idioms, uh, and and to understand what how to communicate or to, to communicate that clearly in English, you first need to understand what the meaning is behind those words, not just not just the equivalent words, but the equivalent meaning, the idea behind them. And if we get into the Spanish culture and way of thinking, we, we find out that to not have hairs on your tongue is to be a straight shooter. It's to tell it like it is. And uh, to throw the house through the window is a way of saying, I'm going to spare no expense. I'm going to do whatever it takes. So what I really said was, today when I preach, I'm going to, be, I'm going to tell it to you straight. I'm going to do whatever I can to help you understand. But there's that work of translation, getting into the original kind of culture and language and figuring out the message that is intended and then figuring out how to communicate that same message in English. Does it make sense? This is what we always have to do when we do the work of translation and it's a, a basic principle of biblical interpretation. Whenever we translate the Bible, this is what we do because Christians believe that the authority of the Bible is not in the exact words themselves. Otherwise, we should all be working way harder to learn Hebrew and Greek. Um, but we don't. That, that's kind of what Muslims, of course, believe, or many of them, that the Quran is really only God's word when it's in Arabic. But as Christians, we believe that, that an English Bible can still function, of course, as God, it does function as God's word, because the message, the idea, is, is consistent throughout. It's being communicated. Does, does that make sense? So we do this work of translation when we come to the Bible. We look for the meaning behind these terms and ideas, and we figure out how to communicate that in, in English. Now, I think this is especially important when we come to the topic we're going to talk about today, when we talk about science. A lot of people, both inside and outside the church, have this idea that, that Christian faith and science are at war with each other. They contradict each other. You can't, you can't believe in both. Who here has seen Nacho Libre? Not the segue you expected, was it? <laughs> Nacho Libre, kind of silly movie 15 years ago. Jack Black is, uh, is a worker in a Catholic monastery in Mexico, and he's also a part-time Mexican wrestler. And he recruits a guy named Steven to be his, his partner, and they're terrible. They lose all the time. And Jack Black thinks it's because Steven believes in science and not God, and that if he could believe in God instead of science, and he throughout the movie is secretly kind of trying to baptize Stephen uh, without him really knowing it. Uh, if you would believe in God and not science, then they'd start winning wrestling matches. <laughs> Faith and science, popularly seen as opponents in the ring. And Genesis 1 has often been the ring itself. It's been the battleground where this fight supposedly takes place. Now what I want to say this morning is that if we understand the message that is being conveyed in Genesis 1, if we do that work of translation, we'll see that these two things are actually not in conflict the way a lot of us think that they, they might be. So we're going to talk about what, what Genesis intends to teach. We're going to talk about what science intends to teach. And then we'll conclude with uh, some ways that we are to go forward. Sound good? You ready for this? All right. Um... It seems to me, I'll start out this way, it seems to me that if, if we are to say that Genesis 1 is a blow-by-blow -blow historical account, or that it is an account that is, is somehow a, a scientific exploration of how the world was created, that we run into a number of difficulties. It seems to me that we run into difficulties in terms of genre. Because our expectations of what history writing looks like 
are not what the ancients understood or practiced when they did history. They wrote and talked about real events, but they didn't have the same expectations or conventions that we have when we, when we talk about history. So there's a, a disconnect in terms of genres where we're putting our expectations on Genesis and it doesn't quite work the same. We also, it seems to me, run into problems scientifically, of course. Um, if, if we are to, to believe that this is a blow-by-blow historical scientific account, uh, there are a number of, of issues with modern science as we know it that requires us to do a lot of intellectual gymnastics to kind of get around it. Uh, and third, and maybe most importantly for a lot of us, I, I believe we run into textual difficulties if we go this route. And these aren't things that I'm coming up with on, on my own. These are things that have been noticed for a long time. Really nothing I'm saying today is original to me. So if you're angry with me today, just remember you're not really angry at me. How's that for deflection? <laughs> um, it's been noticed, of course, that in day one, God creates light. And there's, there's day and there's night. And then in day four, God creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And the question is, from the perspective of earth, how do we have three days without the presence of the sun? How does, how does that work? you got light and then the sun three days later. How does that work? In day three, God creates vegetation. He creates the dry land, but he creates the seed-bearing vegetation. In day four, again, God creates the sun. From the perspective of earth, how do we have vegetation before we have sun? That doesn't, quite, that doesn't quite work, the way we understand the world and the way the ancients even understood the world. Uh, there, there are issues when we look at Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2. For example, in Genesis 1, as I just said, vegetation happens on day 3, and, and uh, humans and animals are created on day 5 and day 6. But in Genesis 2, you have this note that there was no seed-bearing vegetation because there, were, there was nobody to take care of it. There was nobody to cultivate it. So, so you got humans coming before vegetation in Genesis 2. Genesis 1, it's the other way around. In Genesis 1, you've got the animals, day 5 and the first part of day 6, being created before the humans at the end of day 6. But in Genesis 2, and this is a bit of a translation issue, so I've got the NASB up there, which I understand to be closer to the Hebrew original, you've got humans being created and then animals. And then you also have this, the fact that a lot of the language that is used in Genesis is, is just simply not technical scientific language. It's, it's language that is, is being adopted from the common way of viewing the world at the time. So, for example, in verse 6, we read about God separating the waters and forming this, this vault, this expanse, to separate the waters. And the Hebrew word there is the word rakia. And that word almost certainly means uh, like, like a solid fixed dome over, over the earth. And this again was the common way of seeing the world at the time. That the world was flat, that it's being upheld by these subterranean pillars, and that there is this firmament, this, this, this dome kind of above the earth that kind of holds back the waters. You see this in other parts in the Bible. In Psalm 104, for example, the same kind of view being employed. Now I don't Say all of this to say, look at all the holes in the Bible. Look at all the contradictions. You can't trust this. You know me better than that. What I'm saying is that all of this points in the direction for me that Genesis 1 is actually not trying to tell us the how or the when of creation. That those are not the questions that this account is trying to answer. That, that, that's, that's, my, that's my conviction, that that's not what's happening here in this, in this text. Um, one Old Testament scholar, an evangelical scholar, says that the ancient Israelites could not have understood exactly how God actually did his creation work, even if he told them. What would that have looked like for Genesis 1, written in that ancient context, to have all this uh, technical scientific language? What would they have done with that? And Anne Averbeck, the guy who says this, he says, we wouldn't know either if God told us exactly how he created it. We still wouldn't understand exactly. 
Uh, another, another scholar says, though the text has much revelation to offer about the nature of God and his character and his work, there is not a single incidence of new information being offered by God to the Israelites about the regular operation of the world. What we see about the regular operation of the world in Genesis 1 is, is almost identical with the ancient Near East as a whole. That's not where Genesis is. That's not what it's trying to reveal. That's not what it's trying to teach. That's not where the, the, the kind of the rubber meets the road. Do you know what I mean? It's not the how or the when. So if that's the case, then what does Genesis 1 want to tell us? If, if, if the content doesn't line up with that, then, then what is it trying to tell us? Now, it seems to me that the key verse here is in verse 2. Verse 2, we read, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Uh, Genesis 1 verse 1 is kind of the, the, the overall title, God made the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 is kind of uh, the context for the rest of the creation days. These six days of creation all happen in the context of an earth that is formless and empty. That there's this chaos, this disorder going on in creation. Um, the, the words here, the Hebrew words, uh, are, are kind of interesting. I, I took a, a Genesis class in Bible college when I was 18 years old. And I, I remember like nothing from that because the whole time I was just writing notes and passing them to girls in the class. Um, and that's something that you usually think like a 12-year-old does. I was 18, kind of delayed adolescence thing uh, going on there. I don't really remember anything, but I do remember the Hebrew words for formless and void. That's the one thing I remember. Because I heard the, the prof saying it over and over again. I thought those are the coolest words ever. You ready for them? Tohu wabohu. Isn't that fun? Tohu wabohu. I want you to say it with me. Three, two, one. Tohu wabohu. You have fun with that? It's good, right? Tohu wabohu. It means a, a desolate wasteland. A, a place that is in, inhabitable. That is inhospitable to life. That's the, that's the picture. That's the problem that creation, as we enter into it, is, is a desolate wasteland that is not, is not hospitable to life. It's, it's tohu wabohu. That's the problem. And what God sets about fixing in the rest of Genesis 1 is exactly this. The problem of formlessness and the problem of emptiness. Lots of people have noticed that Genesis 1 has this pretty neat symmetrical outline to it where the first three days are days of forming and the second set of three days are days of filling and they correspond to each other. Let's walk through it. Let's see how it works. Day 1, God creates light. The structure, the form of light. Day 4, the corresponding day, God creates the sun and the moon and the stars. He fills the form. Day two, God separates the waters above and below. That's the structure. That's the form. Day five, corresponding day, God fills the, the, the skies above with birds and the, and the waters below with fish. He's filling the form. Day three, God creates the dry land and the vegetation. He's, he's creating the form. Day six, corresponding day, he's creating land animals and humans to fill the form of the dry land. You got three days of filling, three days of, sorry, three days of forming, three days of filling the forms. Daryl Johnson, in his book, he says it's like the first three days God's building the house, and the second three days God's building a home. He's making a home for himself. Three days of filling, three days of forming. Uh, and, and it's also been noticed that those, those three days of forming, those first three days, that the first day about light corresponds to time. It's like God is creating time. Uh, the second day is, is about weather. Uh, you've got kind of the atmosphere, waters above and, and below. He's, he's creating the concept of weather, the structure of weather. Day three uh, is, is about agriculture. And these are the same things we read in Genesis 8 after the, the flood, which we'll talk about like, like months and months from now. Um, but after the flood, God makes this promise. He says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, that's day three, that's agriculture. Cold and heat, that's day two, weather. Uh, uh, su uh, summer and winter, day and night, that's day one, time will never cease. These are the structures, the forms that God has made uh, and, and, and are an intrinsic, intrinsic part of creation here to enable life to flourish in this place. 
See, everything about the structure and the content of Genesis 1 tells me that this passage is all about the who of creation and the why. And what does it particularly tell us about the why? Well, the structure tells us that God has created creation to be ordered, to be structured, to be a place where life can flourish, and particularly human life. All of those six days, they climax with the creation of humans at the end of Genesis 1. So all of this is about creating the space, creating the conditions necessary for human beings to be God's image bearers in this place and reflect his blessing. God's created creation, an ordered and structured place to enable humans to flourish as his image bearers in this place. That's why God is created. That's the thing that Genesis is concerned about is the why. And we talked about last week, the who. We talked about how uh, the, the ancients had all these ideas about who the gods were and what they were like. And we talked about how distinct Genesis 1 portrays God. He is the creator. He's God alone. There's no one else. He's a God who works and he likes working. He's a God who's present. And you remember the middle one. You remember the third one from last week? God is a God of blessing. He's a God who creates creation good, which doesn't mean that it's pristinely perfect, but that it is set up for life for flourishing. It's set up for humans to be able to be who God has created them to be. Again, this is the who of creation and the why of creation. That God is a good God who's created a structured world that enables humans to flourish as his image bearers. To me, everything in Genesis 1, the content in the structure points right there. And this really, to me, is consistent with what the Bible as a whole claims for itself as its message, as what it is trying to convey. Um, for example, 2 Timothy chapter 3 is, is maybe the clearest passage about what the Bible intends to convey. Paul writes to Timothy and he reminds him about the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What are the scriptures wanting to do? They're wanting to make us wise for salvation. They're wanting to tell us about the God of salvation and how he has, how, how he has worked to bring about salvation. And that goes all the way back to Genesis. And it goes all the way back to God creating a structured world out of the formlessness and emptiness and the way he wants to continue to do this in your life and in your family and in your city. He wants to take the disorder and the chaos and, and the desolation And he wants to bring about new life in that. He wants to heal it. He wants to restore it. That's what he's doing in Jesus. That's what he's doing in creation. That's the who of creation. The who of Genesis 1. And and 2 Timothy tells us about the why. To train us and equip us in righteousness. To make us a certain kind of people. That's consistent with Genesis 1. That God has created in order to make us a certain kind of people. The who and the why. Not the how and the when. That's what Genesis 1 is trying to convey. Now let's talk about what science intends to teach, what it intends to convey. Um, Science, it has been said, is the study of what is. It's the study of how. It's the study of the processes of the natural world. But it has been pointed out that while science is the study of what is, it cannot tell you what ought to be. Science cannot talk about things like identity and purpose and destiny. It just can't. Albert Einstein, you'll see a quote this week probably on social media where where, uh, Albert Einstein said something similar. Where he says, look, values transcend the limits of what science can talk about. And there are atheist scientists who recognize this as well. For example, Stephen Jay Gould was maybe the most influential atheist of last century. He was a Harvard biologist. But this is what he said. Science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, 
adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. That's a big, those are some big words. Uh, that, that science can't tell you whether or not God is, is behind creation, doing stuff in it. Science can't tell you that. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply cannot comment on it as scientists. And to me, that's, that, that's right. That's true. That resonates with me. That, that's the, that, that science has certain limits that it cannot go beyond. It talks about what is. It cannot talk about what ought to be. But that doesn't stop some from trying to cross that line and make all kinds of statements that science simply cannot make. A couple of examples on that. Here's Stephen uh, Weinberg, uh, who is um, a physicist, a Nobel-winning physicist. He says, it's almost irresistible although false, for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe. That human life is not just a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents reaching back to the first three minutes. It's very hard to realize that this is all just a tiny part of an overwhelmingly hostile universe. What an encouraging, what an encouraging guy, hey? I mean, you want hope in your life? Read some Steven Weinberg. <laughs> I mean, he makes all kinds of claims here that on the basis of science you simply cannot make. Look what he says. He says that humans don't have a special relationship to the universe. Well, on what scientific basis can you say that? That's a statement about identity. That's not something that science can talk about. He talks about how this is all just a kind of a farcical series of accidents. How can science speak to that? How can you verify empirically that these are accidents instead of on, on purpose? He, he talks about how this is an overwhelmingly hostile universe. Again, that's a character statement that science simply cannot make. And Richard Dawkins, who is uh, probably the most influential atheist of today, he makes similar gaffes all the time. He leaves his specialized field of biology and ends up talking, I won't, I won't say the, the, the rest of the phrase, uh, out of his something, uh, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Science cannot refer to stuff beyond what is. Here's another example. I was reading a, a book by Mark Clark, who's a pastor down in Surrey, uh, about the kind of the truthfulness of Christian faith. He's got a chapter on science and faith. Basically, any book these days about, about defending Christian faith needs to have a chapter like that. And he tells a story about a nurse uh, who was in a hospital uh, where the doctors were adamant that this hospital is a purely secular place. We base everything on uh, on hard evidence, scientific evidence, there's no place here for value statements, for, for public expressions of, of religious belief. It's just all secular. That was what they said. And then one night this nurse uh, was, was in a room and the doctor was talking to some other doctors and they were deliberating whether or not to take this, this guy off of life support, this patient off of life support. And the one doctor turned to the others and said, well, at least we know that if we do that, he won't be suffering anymore. And all the other doctors nodded their heads. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true, that's true, that's right. Well, wait a minute. How do you know that? How can you know that in this purely secular place? Is there any empirical way of saying this person definitely will not suffer in any way if we pull them off of life support? If anything, I mean, you would have some stories of people who had died medically, had experienced suffering, and then came back and wrote books about it. And you can believe it or not. But the point is you can't make this statement Empirically, through science, there's a limit here. See, that's, that's connected with a way of thinking that actually I think is, is fairly popular in our world today, which says that only what is scientifically verifiable, only what, only what is, um, yeah, only what you can prove scientifically is, is true and real. That anything beyond that does, is, isn't actually real. That science covers the breadth of human knowledge. Uh, it's called scientism. Not science, but scientism or scientific imperialism is another word for it. Kind of you think about like the imperial empire in Star Wars, the bad guys. Here they are, right here. Scientific imperialism says that, that science covers the whole breadth of, of human knowledge and anything that isn't scientifically uh, provable is, is, not, is not real or not true. Um, there are problems, major problems with this. I was reading a book called Atheist Overreach by Christian Smith. And he says, this, this is like 
or what the first thing he says is that making this statement that only what is scientifically verifiable is true and real is not a statement that you can prove scientifically. It's, it, it's, it's not something that you can say scientifically, and yet that's the basis for this statement. So Christian Smith goes, it's like calling someone on the phone and telling them that you can't talk to them because your phone is broken. It's internally self-contradictory. It just does it, it doesn't work. You can't make that statement scientifically. Now, this is tragic that we're in this place today. Because historically, throughout Christian faith, there was, this, there was always this concept that there are two books of God's self-revelation to humans. There are two books. And we've got to read both of them. The one book is, is the book of creation, of nature. It's, it's, it's a book that reveals God to us in ways that the second book, Scripture, the Bible, is not meant to do. Both these books reveal God to us, his work in the world, in different ways, answering different questions, but that you need both of them together. General revelation and special revelation is another way of talking about it. Uh, and, And the Bible itself points this out. Romans 1, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. There's Paul saying right there, there's this book of God's revelation, creation, nature, which is what science purports to study. And that that reveals certain aspects of God's character to us. But what has happened in the last century or two centuries is that those two books have been torn apart. And so you got some people over here, some Christians who go, we don't need that book over there. It has nothing to add. It has nothing to say to us. All we need is this book. That's it. Nothing over here is important. And then you have other people who, and a lot of people in our world today, who say this book over there has nothing to add. It's, it's all science. It's all, it's all nature. It's all what is. Who cares about what ought to be? This is all that we need. And as a result, we're all impoverished. Because again, these two books need to be read together. A couple of of other considerations here. One is that uh, historically, a case has often been made that modern science as we know it actually emerges from Christian faith, from a Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, Think about it. If, If the world is identified with God, so that the tree is God, and that the grass is God, and that the rain is God, and so on, um, you're you're probably not going to be doing a lot of experiments on nature. You're probably not going to be poking and prodding it, because it's it's, it's divine. You're not going to mess with it. Uh, you also, if, if, you, if you don't believe there's any structure in, in the universe, if you're convinced that everything is kind of random, that, that one day you're going to experience uh, this, and then the next day those, those same kind of conditions in creation are going to be different, you're probably not going to get into science either, because science depends on things being kind of predictable and, and repeatable. So, so if you have that worldview, it's not going to work. It's, it's in a worldview where you say there is an intellectual being who created the world, a structured and ordered place, and wants humans to make the most of it. That's exactly the kind of worldview that leads you to something like modern science. This is what uh, Alvin Plantinga, a, uh, a world-renowned philosopher, has said. He said that the thing we presently call modern science was actually conceived and born and flourished in the matrix of Christian theism. So again, rather than these being opponents, we see science as, as growing out of Christian faith and in complementing the revelation that we have in Scripture. Uh, that's why Christian scientists throughout the years have understood their work as scientists to be sacred work, to be work that honors and glorifies God because it is uncovering the how just as the Bible teaches us the who and the why. And then, and then this other consideration, I've talked about structure and order. The truth is that, that, that science has shown this again and again that there is a structure and an order in creation and And atheist scientists don't know what to do with that. Alexander Vilenkin last week, he's an astrophysicist who 
who had figured out where we, where we come from. He said, I've got this great theory. It's brilliant. It works. We came from nothing. We popped into existence spontaneously from nothing at all. So he figured it out. He's got the answer, guys. That's it right there. Here's, here's what he says, though, right after that in this article I read. He goes, but I still haven't figured out where the laws of physics come from. He's figured out the other thing. No problem. But, but he doesn't know where the laws of physics came from. How, why does this work the way it does? He doesn't know. Which has led a physicist like John Polkinghorne to say, physics explores a universe that is shot through with signs of mind. Thus, the laws of physics seem to point beyond themselves, calling for an explanation of why they have this rational character. See, this is what science is supposed to do. It's supposed to point us to the Creator. It's supposed to open our eyes to who He is and what He has done. That's what it intends to convey. All of this brings me back to the same point, again, that I'm making over and over again. Rather than, than, than Christian faith and science being opponents, being adversaries, and instead we need to understand that they, they offer different perspectives on different questions and that, and that we can hold them together. Now, this is not to say that we, that we wed ourselves to any scientific theory. It's not to say that we pledge allegiance to science. It's, it's not, and, and by the way, when I, when I say this, I don't mean, hey guys, don't worry, Christian faith fits totally comfortably in our modern world. You don't have to make any compromises, or, or you, you don't have to make any sacrifices. You can compromise as much as you want. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about issues and questions in the coming weeks where we will absolutely stand out and where our cultural uh, direction really doesn't fit with Scripture. But this, to me, is not one of those places this is a conflict that we have perceived that actually does not exist. Let me go back to something I meant to say before. Science is not the problem. Scientism is the problem. And I would even go so far as to say evolution as a scientific theory of how things came to be is not actually a threat to Christian faith. It's evolutionism. It's when evolution becomes a worldview that strips away purpose and meaning from life and says that everything is just random and chance. That's the issue right there. It's when science goes beyond the limits of science. But when science stays within what is, and we understand the Bible to be talking about what ought to be, then we're okay. Now this raises one final question for me, which is, what does God want us to do about all of this? What's the response he's looking for? Because whenever you communicate a message to somebody, you're always expecting a certain kind of response, right? Um, Carolyn and I had our, uh, our wedding anniversary this past week. It was January 15th, which is also our anniversary, me and you as a church. January 15th, three years ago, I preached my first sermon here. You called me to be your pastor, and nobody remembered our anniversary. I didn't get a single flower or card. Apparently, this means a lot more to one of us than the other. Okay? I'm just saying. Just saying. In any case, it was our wedding anniversary, and we both remembered, and it was great. And uh, we actually went to Victoria for a night, and so we're saying goodbye to our kids. And uh, Carolyn goes first, and she gets down, and Zachary is just in his, in his he's lost in his own world. And he's, he's playing with, like, Paw Patrol figurines, and there's a whole thing happening. And Carolyn just wants to say goodbye to him. And so she gets down eye to eye. She's like, Zachary, I'm not going to see you till tomorrow. I love you so much. He's just going on playing. He's like, Zachary, I love you. I love you. Finally, he looks up. And I'm not exaggerating. These are the exa this is exactly what he said. He looks up at Carol and he goes, okay. And then he, he goes back to playing. <laughs> I can assure you that's not the response that Carolyn wanted to evoke from her words of love. <laughs> that was a little bit different than that. See, God, God gives us his revelation in creation and in scripture, and he, there's a certain thing he, he wants from us. There's a certain response he's looking for. And I'm fairly certain the response is, that he's looking for is not to turn Genesis into a battleground, but instead, I believe the response he's looking for is, is for us to turn to him in praise and worship. 
Hey, Psalm 104 is this psalm that I've, I've referenced today and that some of your community groups maybe used this past week. It's the great creation psalm that just looks at how God cares for his creation. And Psalm 104 begins and ends, book ends that whole thing about creation the same way. It starts with, praise the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. This is what God means for us to do with what we have been given in Genesis and in creation itself. He means for us to turn to him in praise and worship for all that he has done and all that he is. Um, quick story uh, to, to conclude here. I told you that Carolyn and I went to, uh, Carolyn and I went to Victoria uh, for a night for our anniversary. I didn't tell you how we got there. We, uh, we took a helicopter um, we have a, a friend of ours who is a helicopter pilot, and I was telling someone before the service, this is a friend that everybody, I think, should have. Um, everybody should find a helicopter pilot friend. Um, this friend uh, gave, us, uh, gave us guest passes, uh, so we were able to go, go on, on this helicopter to Victoria, and, and neither of us had ever been on a helicopter before, and it was so incredible! It was amazing. Like it was, it's so different from flying in a plane. You just lift up and you go. And I, it was just so cool the whole time. We're just like nudging each other. Like, can you believe this? I have this huge grin on my smile for all 30 minutes. I was just blown away. And the whole time, I am just inside, in, in, inside myself just going, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You're flying over. You know, you see downtown and you see the North Shore and, and you're flying over the Gulf Islands. And then it was this day on Friday where there these cloud formations were just phenomenal. You're flying through the clouds and, and you see the ocean below and, and it's just like this overwhelming desire to praise and to worship the one who made all of this. The whole time I'm sitting there, there's someone behind me. He's a businessman. And, uh, and, and I, as whenever I look back, his head was just buried in a newspaper. And, and I get it. Like, I, I get that probably, like, he's some super rich, important guy who rides helicopters all the time. Okay? Like, don't rub it in, man. I see that. Okay? I know that. But still, it just, it just struck me that, that this is what God intends when he reveals himself to us, when he reveals his beauty and his glory and his, and his majesty, and he reveals his purpose for all of this in Scripture, he means for us to turn to him in worship and praise. But it doesn't inevitably do that. It doesn't automatically do that. See, we can get so wrapped up in debates and arguments, and we can get so wrapped up in the, in the events of our lives and our world and the distractions and the brokenness and all of this that we never just stop and notice and turn around and praise him for that. And so that's my prayer for you this morning. My prayer is that as you enter into Genesis 1, that you would see the God who made all of this and who made you with a purpose. And that you would see in the Bible that this same one who made you, who made this universe, who made it the way it is, who has a purpose for you, uh, who it continues to love you, even when you go astray, even when you, when you go against that purpose, even when you fall away from him, he still loves you. He's with you. He loves you so much that he's come in the person of Jesus Christ. He's died on the cross in your place so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be reconciled to him, and that you could be washed clean. He's done all of this for you. My prayer is... That as you experience God in creation and as you encounter his character and his purpose in his word, that you would be drawn to worship and that you would see that he alone is worthy of giving your life to.